presence of the Lord together. And if you are here and it's your first time, we're excited today that you chose Pottersville Church as a place of fellowship. May you enjoy the Lord in this place. And for those joining us online, thank you as well that you could just put everything aside and say, I want to be part of what the Lord is doing. The Lord is right there with you. Just enjoy being in the presence of the Lord. Together again, let's just give them the highest, highest praise this morning. As we continue with our worship this morning, may I just encourage you that we do have communion stations. Please do take your friends, family, go and break the bread together. The Lord encourages us to do that as often as we could. Also, if the Lord gives you a word, please come share with Pastor Kurt, Paulette, and Pastor Julius so we all get to hear what the Lord is saying. Let's read our scripture together from the book of Psalms 138. We'll read verses 1 and 2. Let's read together. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the God, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified the word above all your name. Let's magnify the Lord together. Let's worship him who sits on the throne. Yes, Lord, we here to worship you this morning. And we just want to thank you for your love that knows no bound, Lord. For your love that is always there for us, God. So this morning, we just get to celebrate you, King Jesus. Let's praise the Lord, church. Let's worship him together this morning. Thank you, Lord.
that you are ever kind. Thank you, Lord, for always showering us with your love, O oh Lord. This morning we choose to celebrate you. This morning we choose to dance before you. This morning we choose to clap before you, Lord, because you are good, because you love us so much, oh God. So, Lord, together this morning we want to lift your name on high and say there is no other God but you, God. You are God and you are so faithful. We are looking back at what you've done for us, Lord. All we can say is that you are good. You are faithful. You are so full of love for us as your children. Church, let's magnify the Lord together. Let's give him the highest praise that is due to him. He is worthy of our praise. He alone is God. We worship you, Jesus. We love you, King of Kings. We bow before your throne. We salute you because you are God. You are our Father. We are loved by you, O oh God. We can feel your love. We can feel your embrace this morning. Surround us, O oh God. Surround us with your love. Your Holy Spirit, may you move among us, O oh God, and touch us because we love you and you love us. You are good. Let's bless the Lord, church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your faith.
God has been so faithful to us. He has done so much for us. I think where you are this morning, you can count. You can count at the things and say, yes, this is the Lord. Yes, this is the Lord. Yes, this is the Lord. The list is endless because He's been so faithful. And I just want to assure you that He will continue to be faithful because He's a faithful God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.
of the situation that he was facing. He couldn't do anything but rather beg. But one day, Peter and John went by that place called Beautiful. They came across this man as usual. He was begging for money, but they were so faithful to him. They told him the truth that silver and gold we do not have but we have one thing that we can give to you that is the name of Jesus and they said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk I feel like that's what the Lord is saying to some of us here this morning he's saying there is power in his name his name bring life in that lifeless situation that you are faced with today as I was praying this morning I just felt God saying I am life in that place where there is hopelessness, the Lord is saying, I am hope. So as we sing, calling the name of Jesus, let me just encourage you to trust his name with the situation that you are faced with today. It can be sickness. It can be lack. It can be any struggle. There is power, wonder-working power in the name of Jesus. Let's call his name. Even if it's about your children, call the name of Jesus. It's about your career, call the name of Jesus. It's about your business, call the name of Jesus. It is the name that we've been given, the name that is above all other names. I love when the word of God says that the mention of his name, every new will bow, so every situation will bow at the mentioning of his name. Church, let's call the name of Jesus. Bring whatever that you're struggling with and trust the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this powerful name. Thank you, Jesus, that you've given us your name, Lord. So we call your name over our relationships, over sicknesses in this place. We call your name. Yes, Lord. Cancer, we command you to live in the name of Jesus. Migrant headaches, we command you to live in the name of Jesus. Backache, we command you to live in the name of Jesus. Lord, we call your name. Your name is power. Your name is life. Breaks every stronghold. That is your name, God. We bless you, Jesus. And we call your name in every situation. Jesus, 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 powerful name. Thank you, Lord. Let's bless the name of Jesus this morning.
those who are joining us online, Lord, we know you're right there with them. As they bring to you, Lord, they are struggling, speaking the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus. We know there's a shift in the atmosphere that's going on, Lord, because you are doing something. And it is something greater, God, something that will give a powerful testimony to your goodness and to your faithfulness, oh God. So, Lord, we just lay down everything and we trust your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for healing, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the transformation, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the restoration. Yes, it's your name, Lord, powerful name of Jesus. And we just want to bring ourselves to you, Lord, and we pray that you continue doing something in your love, your peace, your peace, Lord. It just says the Lord is just covering us with his peace this morning. Peace, perfect peace. We thank you, Lord, for your peace. Thank you, Lord, for just covering us with your peace. Even in that situation where you were like you were struggling, the Lord is just giving you peace, peace that surpasses all human understanding, the peace of God. Thank you, Lord. We receive your peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for covering us with your peace this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's bless the Lord. Let's bless the Lord.
because you God all powerful Lord and we know Lord that you hold everything together when we are in you we are in the right place so we choose Lord to just fall at the foot of the cross Lord and say have your way in our lives Lord have your way may you be Lord over us Lord and Lord we just want to pray for the nation as well that may you be Lord over this nation in the name of Jesus we trust you Lord because you are faithful we trust you Lord because of your love that we've seen in our lives Lord carry this nation Lord carry us through Lord we look unto you Lord we focus on you Jehovah God in Jesus name Amen 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 Thank you so much family can I invite you to take a seat we're so really grateful to have you with us a couple of announcements that I'd just like to make before we ask Pastor Kevin to come up. And the first is, if we can please remember Wednesdays. It's such an amazing time of just healing of our hearts. So at 6 o'clock, we have this life transformation series that we're going through. And if you can be with us, you will feel just the change in your heart and in your life. Also, I'd like you to save the date. On the 1st of October, Saturday, we are going to have that one love walk we're going to meet here we're going to go up the hill to spend that time in fellowship and family together and just celebrating each other so if you can make it please save the date we would love you to be a part of the excitement on that day and then also uh, I'd like us to be aware that we're having baptisms after the second service today so if you'd like to just share in the joy of seeing just this new regeneration of life Join us after the second service. And can I ask you to just give a warm welcome to Pastor Kevin as he comes forward. <laughs> Father, we just praise and honor you and we thank you for the way that your word touches our hearts and our lives and that it achieves the purpose for which you send it. We thank you for the way that Pastor Kevin has just been anointed by you to be an incredible teacher and we pray your blessing on him. And Father, open our hearts and our minds as we receive your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Morning. It's such a blessing to be able to be together this morning, and I just thank you for your grace and the calling upon your lives to be here with us. Thank you so much, Tanesh. That's very good of you. Thank you. This morning, um, I want to pick up on a new series. We really feel like the Lord is wanting to bring a new series with us, and uh, it's called Training to reign, train to reign. Tell your neighbor, train to, train to reign. And there's a reason why we feel like this is really crucial right now. And that, and that is that right now, as the circumstances happen around us, it's easy to be in a place where it's, it's easy to be discouraged. And I believe that the heart of the Father is that every life here has a purpose has destiny attached to it. I believe that Jesus had in mind more than mere survival. God had in mind that we would thrive in Christ Jesus. And the problem is when the goal of our faith is that we, we just trust God to keep us safe to go to heaven, I believe that we miss the heart of the Father, which is to reign in life here on earth, that God would have us reign here on on earth, in life. And as I say that, there's two translations I want to read to you. The first one is from Romans chapter 5, verse 17, New King James Version, and then I'll read the ESV version. But Romans 5, verse 17 says, verse 18 says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, in other words, because of the death through one man, death and sin inf affected all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Well, the ESV version says, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus. So the heart of the Father is that you reign in life through Christ Jesus. Can I ask you to again say to your neighbor, reign in life. Reign in life. Paul is saying because 
death came through one man and infected and spread across the whole earth to infect all of us, how much more through Christ Jesus, who Christ having come to give life and grace, how much more does God want us to reign in life right now? But reigning in life isn't necessarily a place where you lord it or rule it over other people. Reigning in life means that money doesn't control you, you control money. Reigning in life doesn't mean that you, that you control relationships, but it does mean that when relationships go south, you aren't dragged down with it. You, you rise above the circumstances. God would have us be in the place where we recognize that his grace and his mercy is sufficient for us today. His grace is sufficient. Remember, Father God doesn't just save us from hell, but rather God saves us from hell and gets us to reign in life here on earth. As disciples of Jesus, I believe the Lord wants to train us to become more than overcomers, become more than conquerors. And as I say that, I wanted to share with you one of the things that I believe that that the Lord wants us to do is to allow Him to train us. Allow Him to train us. We need to be rewired. We need to be retrained. We need our thinking changed and transformed. And as I talk about training and being disciplined, if you know me well enough by now, you'll have heard me talk about rugby every now and then. I love to watch international rugby teams play especially when Ireland is playing, because that was where my father was originally from. And, and I like to watch the Springboks play. And if you will just humor me and just understand, as I wanted to show you a clip, but before I do, just consider this. When a rugby team comes together, they have to train as a body. They're coached by several coaches. And each person plays a specific part in the team. And all 15 members of the team have to fulfill their role. If they don't, the whole body suffers. And so I wanted to show you this clip from three weeks ago uh, from Nelspreit as the guys were playing against the New Zealand team. Just watch this clip for a moment. As you see, this one guy give this high kick. The other person runs up, catches it, gets tackled, passes it on, and then he gives the glory to God as he scores the try. <laughs> Just watch this again. It's incredible. These are pinpoint kicks with people putting their bodies on the line, strength training, speed training. But as you see these things, we need to understand that the team can't operate unless it's one thing team working together. Each one depends on the other. If the eight men in the scrum didn't bring the back the ball, there's no way they could have pinpointed it. And don't tell me that that pinpoint kick just happened by accident. They were trained to reign. They were trained. They were disciplined. They had to be coached in the process. And I believe that and feel that the Lord wants us to recognize that there's areas in all of our lives that we need more training, more coaching, that we need to be more intentional about some phases of our lives, some parts of our relationships. And one of those areas that I believe that God wants to focus and put a light on is in the area of fellowship. The Greek word for the word fellowship is the word koinia, and it conveys the meaning of people coming together to gather together to break bread and to fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. There's this part about having fellowship which is it's coming to give, to give to God, to hear from God. It's not merely attending. You know, there are a lot of people who attend church. There are few people that fellowship in church. And I believe that God wants us to learn the secret and the blessing of true fellowship, koinir, of understanding how in this place 
God uses every part of the body to play its role, to empower, to encourage, and to equip one another. And as such, can I ask you this morning just to pause and say, I bless you in Jesus' name to your neighbor. Tell him, I bless you with peace today. When you did that, you did something that God called you to do. You spoke life into that person. Now, whether that person receives it or not, that's their issue. I believe God wants us to focus today on fellowship and the next three, four Sundays on three, four other areas. If you could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, reading from the NLT version, the scripture says, don't, didn't, don't you realize that in every race, that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? That's interesting because in this day and age, I think when people go to a race, everyone wants to win a prize. And you go to school and everyone's expecting to get a prize and sort of an entitlement. And, and the heart of the Father is to recognize even God says, in this race, this race, only one person wins a prize. And here he's talking about the Olympic Games. But in verse 25, he says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. Disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm intentional in every step. And this morning, I want us to be intentional about the word fellowship. I'm not just shadow boxing. And I don't know if you've seen shadow boxing, but shadow boxing is just punching into the air, almost like it's aimless, right? I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. Now, the interesting thing is Paul is using this Olympic language because he's writing a letter to Corinth, which has been hosting the Olympic and the Isthmian Games. Every four years were the Olympic Games, and the year before the Olympic Games was what's known as the Isthmian Games, and the year after the Olympic Games was also the Isthmian Games. It looked like something like this. This is the title of the Isthmian Games, which was held in the city of Corinth, and the wreaths for winning a race were made out of pine leaves and celery leaves. Now, these pine leaves that you would win, having won the race, or celery leaves, as the heat increased, they didn't last very long. And so Paul was saying, these wreaths that you win as you win the race, they don't last long, but I'm calling you to run a race that's for eternal crown, not just for pine leaves, not just for celery leaves, but for an eternal crown in heaven. He's not talking about athletics. He's referenced the Olympic Games to mirror the walk in life. He's talking about our faith life. He's talking about the need for us to recognize that we need to train, we need to be coached, we need to coach, we need to be disciplined, we need to discipline others. Have you considered for a moment how much athletes do need to train to win that prize? I mean, even those who run a 100-meter sprint, they don't come alone. The famous people that we know, they have coaches that coach them with starting, with, coach, with sprinting the first 40, and coach the next 60, and then they have physios. It's a whole team. And it's not just one day they get up and they run and suddenly they're a world champion. They've taken time with their diet, with their training, with what they, they do with their life. And when I research the most successful athletes and the most successful business people, I found out that every one of them makes the statement that discipline trumps talent every time. Tell your name, discipline trumps talent. <laughs> now, talent is needed. The raw talent is needed. And God gives us, every one of us, a gift, a talent. But we need to train. I remember hearing about Gary Player. 
he was uh, winning, he was a famous South African golfer years ago, and he was winning and winning every time, and some people came by and said, yo, you know, Gary, you are getting better and better, and you are getting luckier every time you play. And so Gary Player turned around and he said, you know, it's interesting, the more I train, the luckier I get. <laughs> I thought about Bruce Lee, because I know a lot of people know Bruce Lee. Who knows Bruce Lee? Okay, I thought about Bruce Lee. You know what he said? Bruce Lee said this, I fear not the man who's practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. I was thinking about this famous uh, weightlifter, Liu Qiyun, from China. She was said to be going to win Tokyo outright. No one could compete with her. She was streaks ahead of everyone. She was training for the Tokyo Olympics 2021. She was powerful. The headliners were there. No one would stop her from winning. She would be number one. Little did they know about an unknown person, a woman of God. Her name is Hadeline Diaz in the Philippines. And the Philippines had never won a gold medal in the Olympic Games ever before. Never, ever, ever. Well, she started training, and the problem with, for Ms. Diaz is that as, as the Olympic Games came up, COVID hit Philippines, and co Philippines was completely shut down. No one could train. She couldn't attend any competitions. So whilst everyone else was being allowed to train in the gyms, etc., outside of Philippines, in the Philippines, she wasn't allowed to do anything. She had to stay at home. She thought her days were numbered. Then she got this idea as she's praying. She actually says, but God. So what she did is she started getting a bamboo stick. And she took some duffel bags and she put water bottles in the duffel bags and she started training at home, just lifting and lifting and lifting. And then she took the water bottles and put them on isolation, started training and training. When she got to the Tokyo Olympic Games, she won and she broke the world record, lifting over 224 kilograms across two successful titles. She broke the world record. And so the Philippines produced this beautiful stamp of her. She out-trained and she out-disciplined the others. Listen to the scripture again in verse 25. All athletes are disciplined, are trained in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we, as Christians, we do it for an eternal prize. And we need to run with every step, not just shadow boxing. Again, the idea of shadow boxing is that you're, you're boxing on the side, but you're hitting nothing. You're moving, but you're not moving forward. It's this picture of being aimless, without purpose, without real purpose, working hard, but hitting at nothing. Can I be, at the moment, just really vulnerable with you as... The Lord has put me in here as a father to the church, to those who are online. I don't know about you, but for me, 2020 to 2022 was really tough. I, I, there's times it really... I, I, you know, I lost my father. He's at home with the Lord. And... Uh, there were so many lost lives of loved ones from this family and extended family. Friends that have gone home early. There was this horrible COVID struggle. Not just the COVID struggle, but the political tensions that we were experiencing. The financial pressures and the hyperinflation. And then the submission to the COVID regulations that come from CDC to mask up to stand back two meters, not to be able to fellowship in terms of eating together, not to be able to lay hands on one another, not to be able to worship at times when we got shut down. It was tough. How many of you found the last two years tough? And in this tough time, The CDC regulations on COVID 
have made it very easy for many of us to step back from fellowship because we've got to wear our masks and not reveal, not give, not speak life into people because we weren't able to lay hands on the sick and pray for them or give each other a healthy hug because we weren't able to commune together and because of very real health issues, some people couldn't even come into fellowship. They had to stay back. And so because of the CDC regulations that have happened, it's been easy to justify that people pull out and stand back. And now as church opens, sometimes it's hard, you know, even when we started and we were allowed to open up church and we had masks, worshipping with masks was tough. It took me about, I'm the pastor, it took me about three services of singing my, with my mask on before I had complete breakthrough. I mean, I can sing at home and I can sing here, but when you've got your mask on, there's something inhibiting you. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I damaged my nose playing rugby and damaged my nose playing, swimming in a swimming pool. <laughs> and, and so breathing is, is often tough, but we have to honor authority and it's right that we honor authority. But then as we people come back into church, I mean, even families on their own have got issues. You've all got that guy in your family, haven't you? <laughs> There's always that guy in your family, some, you know, that, that person over there that's in your family that's just like not nice. It's hurtful, right? That guy. Can you say with me, that guy? <laughs> well, now you come to church and, and you see that, that guy's at church. <laughs> it's like, oh. If no family is perfect, then how can church be perfect? And the other thing is, as soon as you get to know each other, listen to this, familiarity breeds contempt. And because you've been pulled out and you're not in fellowship, it's much easier to judge the person. Ha, because you're wearing a mask. Ha, because you're not wearing a mask. Ha, because you had the vaccine. Ha, because you didn't have the vaccine. So easy to become judgmental and pull out from the fellowship where we become our own authority and we determine what we're going to hear and we live in our own echo chamber of our own, right? Just this echo chamber of what we determine what we'll hear. Consider this for a moment. What if Satan's main goal with COVID was to, because I do believe that COVID was an attack of the devil, to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, what if his main goal using COVID was to get you out of fellowship. Because fellowship is the place, I'm not talking about attending, I'm talking about fellowship. Fellowship is the place where you come to speak to God, to worship with God, and to hear God, and speak to those who are you with, and speak the word of God, and receive the word of God. It's an active participation of the gifts flowing, like that game of rugby. Everyone playing his part. What if his intent was to get you to withdraw? To get you out of the blessing that comes through fellowship, where iron sharpens iron. Because you're not in fellowship, you get blunt. Where the commanded blessing of God is, where the anointing of God is on you. The place of fellowship, think about it this in Acts chapter 2, the disciples were in the upper room in fellowship. Tell your neighbor, in fellowship. in fellowship. And when they were in that upper room, please understand, not all those people in that room were liked by each other. You try being that number of days together in one room. They don't even want to know where the bathroom was. The reality is, you've got 120 people in the upper room waiting on the Lord, and then the, whew, the Holy Spirit moves. It's in fellowship when they're in one accord, the Holy Spirit moves. And it's the fellowship, in the fellowship, that God gives himself as a gift to the church. And he says, this is my church. And he appoints to the church the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, the fivefold ministry. The point of the fivefold ministry is to train, to discipline, to raise up each one of us to the full measure of Christ. It's in the church, in the fellowship, that elders are appointed to pray for the sick. 
And yet Paul goes on to say this in verse 27. He says in verse 27, I have to discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Because I, I imagine sometimes coming to fellowship, Paul felt, yo, yo, that guy's at church, yo, that's tough. But he didn't do what he felt like, he did what he had to do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. He trained, he disciplined himself. In this season, Satan has used the, the heart to try and distract us, to discourage us, to divide us, to bring us to a place of doubt. He's got us out of fellowship into a place of watching what I want, when I want, how I want, and where I want. There are a lot of eyes in that, aren't there? I found that Satan has tried to whisper four main lies into people's thoughts, into my thoughts even, in order to get us to withdraw from fellowship because he doesn't want you in the commanded blessing. He doesn't want you iron sharpening iron. He doesn't want you under the fivefold ministry. He doesn't want you empowered and equipped in, his, in the body of Christ. The first one is this, this lie. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That's a lie. That I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, let me tell you, first of all, you don't. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But think for a moment. Jesus, through Paul, talks about how the church is his. And he shows a picture of how the church is like the picture of a marriage. Turn to your neighbor and say, a marriage. He says the church is the bride of Christ. He's the bridegroom. It's a picture of the marriage. The local church is the one thing that Jesus left behind for us to grow in and to grow. But God likens this relationship, your relationship, to the church, like a marriage. The church is his. He's the father of the church. And in the scripture, in Corinthians, he says, he places us and he sets us in the church as he pleased. Not as we please. He places us in the church as he pleases. In Ephesians 4, 16, he says this, he makes the whole body fit together as, part, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. As you consider how the body works and how the church is seen as a marriage and as family, how would your relationship with your spouse, for those of you who are married, could you, if you're married, could you put up your hand? Or if you've been married, could you put up your hand? Okay. Those of you who want to get married, could you put up your hand? We'll be praying for you in Jesus' name. Amen, I see you. We'll be praying. <laughs> now, how would this work if you were to call your spouse and say, Honey, I know we're married, but I don't believe I need to come home if I'm married. <laughs> I'll see you once a year, but we're married. How would that relationship work? I think that marriage would crumble to pieces. And when you treat fellowship like that and say, I'm just going to attend, or I don't have to go to church. No, you don't. But you will not be sharpened as the Lord wants you to go. And what if Satan's main goal is to distract you so that you don't walk in fellowship? Because fellowship is where you get trained. You cannot thrive being if you're not committed to the local church. And by the way, our role model is Jesus. He attended the local church. The scripture tells us in Luke 4, 16, when he came to the village of Nazareth, that's his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. He went as usual. Tell your neighbor, as usual. As usual. In other words, he was going regularly. Now let me just remind you, 
that church, the synagogue, was not necessarily filled with the life. They were trying to persecute him, and he still went there. He was being defamed there. He still went there. They didn't like them. He still went there because he was set in the body. If we are to be like Jesus, then we need to learn how to worship like Jesus. We need to learn how to fellowship like Jesus. God not only formed you in the womb, in your mother's womb, but he set you and placed you in the body of Christ as he pleased for his sake, not as we please. He sets us in the church to grow us through fellowship. Listen to Hebrews 10, verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially, most especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. As times get tough, especially now, in Acts 2, verse 42, he says, all the believers, turn to your neighbor and say, all the believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, giving and taking, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to pray. There is something very special about fellowship where we allow Holy Spirit to come and fill us, empower us, encourage us, and equip us to minister to others. There is a commanded blessing. Listen, when one prays, a thousand are put to flight. But when two pray, according to God, 10,000 are put to flight. That's why he says in James 5, verse 14, are any of you sick? If you are sick, call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. There's this fellowship. The second lie is this. I worship God each week but I do it online. Okay, I know that some people are not well and healthy and they have to do it online. Praise God we've got online church. Amen? Media, thank you so much. Let's give them a clap. And for you who are traveling, praise God you can join us online. And for those who are checking out whether Potter's Wheel is the right place to, to come to or not, that's a great place to go online. But for those of us who have got comfortable sitting at home in our PJs with a cup of coffee and a rusk, <sighs> because it's just so easy, I don't have to see that guy. <laughs> Galatians 5.13 says, says this, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. <clears throat> Come in and fellowship. Romans 12, 10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Look for a way of honoring that guy, loving that guy. Hebrews 3, says uh, three thirteen, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Because sin hardens our heart, and so we get distracted and discouraged, and we're on our own. Remember Proverbs 18.1? A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but only in expressing his view, his opinion. And so the heart of the Father is, remember the picture of marriage. How would your spouse react to a call from you to say, honey, I love you so much, but can we just do marriage online? <laughs> Some might say, I walk around my business and Whilst I'm in business, I'm worshiping. Praise God, you should be doing that. I'm ministering. Praise God, you should do that. And some would say, that's my church. Praise God, church is the people. But actually, God calls us to fellowship. We're designed to do life in community. God designed us to do life in community. And if you're out of the community of God, you, we're shadow boxing. And, and I found, even for myself, I, I was really challenged by the Lord in this. Because COVID gets you to stand back. 
COVID gets you to not visit. You're not allowed to visit. You're not allowed to go commune with people. And so the habit of standing back becomes tough. The word church is the word ecclesia, the gathering of God, of people of God coming together to worship. The building is simply a tool to keep you dry when it's raining and to keep you cool when it's hot. It's a facility that people come into. The third lie that I've often heard, and sometimes I've heard the lie myself, where it says, I have too many commitments. Workers, party. Let me tell you, life is short. Eternity is real. Amen. And people matter most. Amen. The problem with the lie that I'm too busy is that life does shoot you by fast. And the greatest gift you can give to your children is actually a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they watch you to see how you walk and how you talk how you live, how you fellowship. We need to train our families in the way of the Lord, where we center our lives around Jesus Christ and the authority of his word, his values, becoming the most important thing in our life. What does Jesus say? Because when crisis hits, it's not work that's going to hold your marriage together. It's not money that's going to hold your family together. It's not sports that's going to hold the whole unit together. It's God, His grace, His mercy, and His grace is sufficient. That's why Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll never depart from it. So we need to, I believe, train ourselves, discipline ourselves to be in fellowship, waiting upon God to share what God wants us to share, to, to be His hands and feet, be sharpened by others, and be a vessel of life to others. I know uh, some people say, but I'm just so busy. In Luke 14, verse 18, there's a, a parable Jesus gives. It's quite a shocking parable. Can you say with me, Luke 14, and verse 18? If you go there later, it says, but they were all with one accord and began to make excuses to, to not attend the fellowship. The first one said, I've bought a piece of land I must go and see it. Please excuse me from attending the fellowship, attending the wedding supper. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. You know, I've bought a nice motorbike, I've bought a nice car, and I'm going to test them. Please, can you excuse me? Another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And so the servant brings the news to the Lord, and the Lord says, okay, go out into the highways and byways and call all the others to the supper. And then he says this in verse 24, For I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. So there's something that God would have us all be challenged in to move our relationship in church from attending to fellowshipping. God calls us to fellowship because it's good for us. And like our marriages, we have to work on fellowship. Uh, Helen and I, um, we, we took three days off this week. We went up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to the Kruger Park and just, w w we have been intentional to take time out because we want our marriage this next year to be better than the past year. But we have to be intentional about working on our marriages, talking about the things that press buttons and sharing about how to say things better to each other and how to communicate love and how to equip and empower one another. It's the same for the church. It's the picture of marriage. And the busier we get, the more intentional we need to be. The fourth and last lie is this. I feel shame for what I've done. I've fallen short of the glory of God, and I feel shame for what I've done. So coming to church makes me feel uncomfortable. But let me share with you from the very first sin where Adam and Eve hid from the Father, God pursued Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? He pursued Adam. Father God pursued Adam. And when they came out of hiding, he immediately killed an animal, took the skins, and covered Adam and Eve. 
He made skins for them. He covered them. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died for us, giving his body and shedding his blood to cover our shame so that we would no longer live in shame, but that we would be covered and have double honor. He covers us and he washes us as we let him. The last place you need to be if you're struggling with shame is at home. The first place we need to be is in the house of God, fellowshipping with God and with the saints. And by the way, this is why we've got communion elements to my left and to my right. And today, can I ask you to consider taking communion with your family? Because when we take communion, we remember that his body was given for our sin and our shame and our sickness. His blood was shed to wash away the past, to give us new life. Paul says, and he says this in love, he says, we are to commit to grow in every way, including fellowship, into him who's the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the whole body grow so that it grows itself up in love. This is the blessing of fellowship. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to recognize this morning that many of us through COVID, just like I, just like Kevin Ward has, many of us have stepped back from the fellowship level that God wants with one another. And I believe that God wants us to recognize the Satan's trap and God's blessing, commanded blessing, God's anointed, anointing, God's way of sharpening us, God's way of getting us to come under the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and the beauty of the anointing that breaks the yoke of shame by coming into true fellowship with first God and second with the saints in his church. For those who are here every Sunday, well done, keep consistent, but can I ask you if you can commit to fellowshipping. When you come here, don't just come to attend. Look for somebody to pray for. Look for somebody to bless. Look for somebody to share encouragement. Fellowship with one another. Don't let the masks hold you back. Don't let the withdrawal hold you back. Push in. Be intentional. For those who have been traveling, and you've been away a lot, we understand. But when you're in town, can I ask you to commit to fellowshipping in the local church? And if you're in another town, you're traveling to Portugal, or you're traveling to uh, South Africa, and you're in, uh, in, in, uh, on Sunday, you're, you're near a church, go to a local church. Get into the church. There's an anointing there that God wants you to enjoy. For those who have been online, can I challenge you to commit to in-person services where you fellowship with one another. And for those who are battling shame, I believe it's time to commit, recognizing you belong here. You belong here. Tell your neighbor, you belong here. here. And and, and commit to fellowshipping because God wants you to have double honor. Can I ask you to stand this morning as I invite the worship team up? Can you turn to your neighbor and say, in Jesus' name, you belong here. Can I ask you just to bow your heads? Father, we want to recognize that you have brought a light to pay attention or bring light to fellowship. For those of you who feel like you recognize you've been removed from fellowship of the saints, for various reasons, can I ask you just to put up your hand before God and say, that's me. Lord, I confess it to you and ask you for forgiveness for being distracted, discouraged, divided, and sometimes even doubting. But I thank you that I can come into your presence and ask you for forgiveness and receive your commanded blessing. I speak over your sons and daughters that put up their hands today the commanded blessing of God, the favor of God, the grace of God. And Father, I ask that you would open their eyes to your love, to your presence, 
to the gifts that you've placed inside of them to use for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we're in a season where the Potter's Wheel family is growing. Children, church is growing. Revival is coming. It's time to start praying for family members and friends that you never thought could get saved because God is doing something. Tell your neighbor, God is doing something. Now let's worship Him as we look to Him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
God is an act of worship this morning, may I just invite you to bow our heads as we pray together. Lord, you Lord who reigns. You reign over our life, Lord. You reign over everything. And Lord, this is the time where as an act of worship, we want to give to you, Lord. We just want to thank you, Lord, for your provision we have because you've blessed us with it. And Lord, we know that you're the source of everything that we have. Even this offering that we are to give to you, it is yours first, Lord. We just want to thank you and honor you for giving it to us. As we give you, Lord, from a very cheerful heart, may you be blessed by our giving, Lord. May our giving bring glory and honor to you, Lord. Be blessed, Lord, by this act of worship through just giving to you our tithes and offering. We thank you, King of glory, and we bless your holy name on high. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, this is the time where as an act of worship, we come and give to the Lord. So let me invite you to come and give to the Lord as we sing Wahamba Nati. to recognize that your fellowship with God isn't right. And maybe you recognize your fellowship with the saints, with the church isn't right. Maybe you recognize you're attending but not fellowshipping. Hear the heart of God. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He blesses you. He loves you. He enjoys you. He sings over you. He dances over you. He rejoices over you. He calls you His favored, His blessed, His chosen, His appointed. He calls you His. 
So this morning, hear the heart of the Father. Come into the fellowship with the Father. Come into the fellowship with the Father to the saints. In Jesus' name. Experience this morning God's commanded blessing. Experience iron sharpening iron. Experience the anointing that breaks the yoke. Experience the favor of God as you see the church as His bride. Stop treating His bride with familiarity. Stop treating His bride with judgment. Instead, love one another. Outdo one another by giving more honor to one another. Bless one another. Pray for one another. Believe for one another. And never give up on one another. Because He didn't give up on you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and as a member of the body of Christ, can you turn to them and say, I bless you in Jesus' name that you would know the grace of the Father and that you would know the love of the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, you are in the right place to receive double honor. In Jesus' name. Those of you who need prayer, who's sick, those of you who are going through a tough time, those of you who recognize you need to step up the attendance into fellowship, the saints, the ministers of the gospel are outside waiting to pray for you and to bless you. God bless you. 